Hey you guys, Matt Allen here. Welcome back to Tactical Bass and today we are talking about how to catch fish in the heat. When it gets hot, where do those fish go and what sort of baits can you use to catch them? When the heat sets in, anglers just, just disappear. Right, a cove like this, back in March, April, there's 20 boats in here. Today, I don't even hear a boat. A lot of guys just wimp out when it gets hot. They just quit fishing. They go do other things. You don't wanna do that. You want to be out on the water in the heat. And today I'm gonna teach you how to consistently catch these fish. The heat, yes, it is uncomfortable. I am sweating today. But the heat positions the fish. It makes them so predictable and it becomes so basic to catch them. It is amazing. The hotter it gets, and I mean hot, hot. I don't care if it's 90, I don't care if it's 100, I don't care if it's 110. Once that water starts getting hot, those fish are so predictable. Everything that they do is driven by shade. Now shade takes very different forms on different lakes and bodies of water. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I wanna make sure that you recognize the types of shade that your fish might be using. You know, we've got very traditional what we think of heavy cover, right? Fish up around matted vegetation, in the cheese, deep in cover. Obviously, that's shade. Another place would be overhead cover. Maybe that's along the shore. All these laydowns I've got back here, fish can get up underneath that brush. Another example of overhead cover would be docks or houseboats, anchored up boats, anything like that, anything suspended on the surface that they can go and get underneath. Fish will be on that. But then you've got less traditional forms of cover. Things like the color line. We've talked a lot about the color line fairly recently, but a lot of people either miss those videos or still don't understand what a color line is. The color line is everything this time of year if your fishery is clearer. I'm not gonna draw a line in the sand and say what clearer means, but the more clear the water, the more the color line is a big player, okay? Here's what you need to understand. In any body of water, Sunlight is beating on that water. You've got the bottom and you got the water line, okay? Sunlight is beating down and going through that water line and hitting bottom. As you get deeper, you reach a point where the sunlight is no longer making it to the bottom and it's just dark. To your own eye from the surface, if you look up along the shore of any lake, you will see the light colored bottom and then somewhere it will transition to that darker color of the open water. That transitional edge from light shallow water to dark deep water, that's the color line. If your lake tends to be murkier, that color line will be shallower and closer to shore. If your lake is crystal clear, that color line can be out in 20 feet of water, 30 feet of water, 40 feet of water. It doesn't matter where it is. That color line is critical. Fish use that line because that edge where light is no longer penetrating all the way down to bottom and illuminating it where you can see it, that edge is shade and the fish use that edge as if it is a shoreline and you need to understand how to fish it. So today I've got key baits for each different situation and I want to explain how I target them in each one of those scenarios because that will help you. Not every lake has all these scenarios in it, but your lake will have one of these scenarios and you can take that information and run with it because once you understand where these fish are set up, 
When the water's warm, their metabolism is high. They need to eat. And it becomes so predictable and so easy to catch these fish. Now, it's not always easy to stand in the heat, especially all covered up, right? But it's worth it when you know exactly where the fish are and exactly what to throw, and you can just go down catching them. Springtime, when they're up on the whole shoreline, you know, around the spawn, you might cover miles of shore searching for those fish. This time of year, once you understand what you're looking for, there's one there, there's one there, there's one there, and you just go catch those fish, keep on moving. So much fun. So let's talk heavy cover first. Then we'll talk the varying kinds of overhead cover. And then we'll talk about fishing out around that color line. So overhead cover is, is the most traditional. Thicker the cover, the deeper in there you've got to go to get them. But when I, when I say cover, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking cheese mats, hyacinth, tulies, reeds, bulrushes, thick matted hydrilla. Okay, that traditional heavy cover. There's three effective ways to fish them. One of them I didn't even bring today, and that is a heavy swim jig. I'll include it in the video description uh, if there's room, uh, but I didn't even bring it today. The other two are my main players. One is the frog. The frog, if you can get it in there, you can get those fish out. And the other one is punching great big tungsten weight paired up to a creature bait. Okay traditional heavy cover fishing. But here's what I want you to understand about these fish. If I'm looking down miles and miles of heavy cover, because sometimes you'll get into a canal and it'll go forever, where the fish are in that heavy cover is still very, very predictable. Man, it is roasting out here today. My lips are burning, my face is burning. Man, I wish I had a rod in my hands. We could catch them right now. So here's the deal. You're looking for something very specific amongst all of the cover so that you're not just wasting time. I, I see guys that go out and fish cheese mats and they'll throw that frog and you see frog track, frog track, frog track every five feet forever. It's not that that doesn't work. It does work because eventually they run into the fish. But I wanna teach you a simpler method. So here's what you're looking for. You're looking for heavy cover within heavy cover. What I mean by that is the biggest fish always take the best spots. The only time they don't is if they are so heavily pressured by anglers that they have to give that best spot up. If anglers don't get involved, the biggest fish are always on the best spots. Which means, if I've got a reed line, tulies, reeds, bulrushes, cattails, whatever type you have, you can flip that stuff for days. But if I see a chunk of hyacinth has blown in and gotten stuck in there, the biggest fish will be sitting under that one clump of hyacinth in the reeds. It's like magic. They take the best spots. Another great example, if you're fishing cheese, you know, just sloppy, nasty, matted up vegetation, but you notice a piece of a log sticking up through it. The fish will literally sit under the log, under the cheese. They'll take the best spot. So stop looking at the giant blanket of grass Start looking past it. Look for the isolated cover in the grass and pick the key pieces. I throw my frog into the darkest holes. If there's openings and I can reach back into heavy cover, that's where my frog is going. Up underneath cover, anywhere I can get in there into the darkest shade holes. The darker the shade is where they are. That's why they're in the sweet spot, the hyacinth, in the reeds, that's the darkest spot. So I'll reach in with a frog. If I can't get them with the frog, then I punch that heavy cover. And again, I'm punching 
the sweet spots. I don't have to fish it all. Now, if there's room between them and you want to make casts, by all means, you make, all means you make the casts. But the key spots are what you are after. You do not have to waste time on everything else. How big do we go when we're punching? You go as big as you have to. I go up to two ounce. I go down to half to three quarter of an ounce. Go with as light of a weight as you can to still consistently get through. If I'm punching through heavy cover and I'm getting through 80% of the time, that's good. If I'm, if I'm not getting through half the time, I need to go to a heavier weight. But I don't immediately go to two ounces so that I get through 100% of the time. Go with the lightest weight you can to still get through the cover most of the time. Because the lighter the weight, the more of the fish you'll land. The heavier the weight, the more likely they'll rip the hook out themselves during the fight. So go with the lightest tungsten you can, heavy wire hook, good swimming, kicking creature bait, and you're in business. That's traditional heavy cover. Now, let's talk about overhead cover. Overhead cover may be, again, up along the bank. I've got shade pockets under the trees. Uh, it could be willow trees that have grown up in a reservoir when the reservoir was down, now it's flooded back up. And it can also be actual floating cover, docks, houseboats, etc. If I've got that cover up along shore, I've got a couple of baits that I use. One is still the frog, okay? Because a frog is an amazing topwater. I can walk it like a regular topwater, but I can shoot it back into dark holes. I can make it disappear up under laid down trees. Just let it vanish back in there and walk it back out. The other two are going to be, well, actually there's three, but the fluke, and the Senko. Those are such good options. If the fish are really aggressive, I throw the flute, because I can rig them on the same hook. I can wacky rig this, or I can put it on a traditional wide gap hook like I do the fluke. If the fish seem to be more active, if I'm hearing blow ups, maybe it's early in the morning, they're still aggressive. Then I focus on the fluke, I work it fast and aggressive out and away from that cover. If they're more lethargic, if I don't see anything going on, it's just a dead sea out here, then those same places, I'll shoot the Senko in there, just let it slow fall. The sen and I don't just mean a stick bait. I mean the Senko as the actual Yamamoto Senko. That one just has more action. It does an amazing job and the fish eat it. So Senko and a fluke, and then the one other one would be the smaller swim bait. This is the six inch mag draft. And that's another bait that I'm able to skip really effectively and I can shoot it back in holes and then slow wind it back out and those fish will ambush it. Now around docks, docks are a different ball game where I've got that hard edge and I can line up and make a perfect cast. Now, a Senko is a great option. Again, if they're really lethargic, you take that Senko, throw it up, you just wait. That'll start to fall. It'll get low enough that it gets below the surface of the dock. And then the fish that are back up under that dock will see it and they come over and they pluck it off. That can work really well. But it, if, if that is not working on any given day, if you're on your lake, they're up in those docks. You know they are. It's hot outside. You flip that Sanko along there and you're just getting nothing. It's time to turn to a swim bait. And I don't just mean any swim bait, I mean a big bait. The smallest bait will be that six inch mag draft. I'm even more likely to throw the eight inch or to throw a big glide. Okay, either one of these, they're going to stay high in the water column and they're going to draw fish over huge distances. Monsters live under docks and big swim baits can catch them even in the middle of summer but they will also draw fish out, even if they won't eat it. You'll find out that one marina has got way bigger fish than another when you slow roll a great big swim bait and you see them come out of the shadows to have a peek and go back in. You see how big those fish are. You know where to focus your attention after that. So the key, I don't really do it. I don't throw the giant glide up around all these little lay downs and things, 
because it's not an effective use of my time. But on docks, on, on big boats that are anchored up, anywhere where there's hard edges, I can line up perfectly right up against the dock, make a bomber cast, and then my entire cast is perfectly in the strike zone down the edge of that dock, and I'll pull those fish out. It's amazing how well that works. Even, it can be 110 degrees, and you can get a giant fish to come out and smoke a glide bait. It's amazing. I've caught double digit fish in August doing this. Now, last major place is going to be fishing out on that color line. So the color line is a whole nother animal. And again, it is effective on any lake, but the clearer the water, the more harsh that sunlight is to those fish. And the more that color line is a major player. So, on the color line, they can be caught just about any which way you want to catch them. They really can, but not every day. So, one of my major baits is a topwater. And I'm talking a color line over 20, 30, 40, 50 feet of water. I'll fish that topwater. The reason why is that fish, when they use that color line, as that sun goes overhead throughout the day, Right at the peak of the day, when it's the highest and it's the hottest, those fish will be way down. But they suspend. If it's in 50 feet of water, they're probably not on bottom in 50 feet of water. They might be 30 foot. But they'll move up and down throughout the day, depending on how harsh that sun is. They'll float up and down. So, you can call fish up 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 feet, and they will crush a top water. And the other thing that's interesting is once the fish latch onto that color line, I find that they stay there. And what I mean by that is first thing in the morning, I'm not up in two feet of water. I'm still on the color line, but the fish are way up and I'm blasting them on a top water out way offshore. Later in the day, they've sucked down. I switch to a different bait, but I catch them on the color line at every time of day. They are living, floating on that color line. Another great option if they don't wanna come all the way up, it's going to be an underspin swim bait. That is a major player for me because you can figure out, you know, throw it out there, count it down five seconds, you start rolling, you get bit. Well, then I know I can run anywhere on that color line, count it down five seconds. I know about where my fish are sitting. The other thing with the color line is not all color lines are created equal, right? Because what I've described to you is essentially a second shoreline in your lake. Those fish have backed out to the color line. Well, that color line follows the entire shoreline. So I'm not suggesting you get on the color line and fish for the next 10 miles. You want to find places where the color line intercepts where big fish would want to be. So that is the color line on the side of long tapering points. The color line, uh, where else? Main lake points. Well, actually where it transitions to bluffs can be really good too. We haven't covered bluffs, but where the color line is coming in and that bank's getting steeper and then it turns to sheer wall, right at that transition from color line back to sheer wall can be amazing. But anywhere a color line is crossing a big point can be huge. The color line around submerged islands, so humps, can be huge. Uh, those key places. The color line on a point with hard rock on it is like the deal. That's the sweet spot. Hard rock in the summer where those fish can back out and suspend and sit will be money. So again, Taking a bait where you can drop it down and fish effectively can be a really good option. The deep crank is another really good option. If you've found them where it's intersecting, that it's going around an underwater hump or it's going around the end of a point and you can fish the end of that point right at the color line and effectively get down with a crank can be amazing. And then if they just don't want to react, that is when you can shift gears and worm them. You know, you can throw the shaky head or you can throw the great big curly tail worm, that traditional summer worming. 
But instead of doing it at random, do it along that color line in those key places and you will be amazed how much more effective you are, how many more bites you get, and how much less time you are wasting out there in the heat. Uh, it's amazing how good it can be once you understand why the fish are doing what they're doing and then where they're going to be, you can go out and just slay them. And all of a sudden, hot days don't sound so bad. Because when I'm in the spring and you get that first hot day, you're like, oh man, it's hot. I'm dying, please don't bring the heat. But come the middle of summer, I look around and I'm the only guy here. And I know where my fish are. And all of a sudden I want it to stay summer forever because you can wail on them. Guys, down in the video description, I'm going to link the different baits for you. I'll link them in the order that we talked about them uh, to make it really easy for you. I'll give you my favorite colors, but these baits or not, take that information and apply it to your lake. These are baits that I trust for those scenarios. These are the baits that I use. Uh, and I'll give you favorite colors for every one of them. But this is a time when you can go out and catch them when other people aren't. And it can be really, really fun. If you guys enjoyed the video, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and we'll talk to you soon.